I am here in the central Kalahari in what they call Deception Valley. And Deception Valley um, essentially is a big pan and it's also what they refer to as a fossilized riverbed, uh, which I mentioned in my background on the central Kalahari in my last post. And basically that means it's uh, an ancient riverbed, meaning many, many, many years ago, thousands, perhaps even millions of years ago, a river of some sort would have flown through this uh, slightly low-lying area um, during, obviously, a, a different climate period when it was much wetter. Today, it's simply a river of grass that extends for many, many miles um, between the Acacia Thornveld uplands on either side, which you kind of see in the background there. And it's a little hard to see this as kind of a river valley because the relief in this landscape is very low, maybe 10 to 20 meters between kind of this low-lying valley that we're in and the uplands on either side. But that depression is just enough that during the wet season for several months, uh, there would be a lot of water here, uh, some surface water perhaps, but at the very least just saturated soils, which makes it really difficult for woody vegetation, shrubs and trees to get established. Occasionally they do, as you see. But for the most part, it just supports grass and some bare earth. And so you have essentially this river of grass extending through this Thornveld landscape which is pretty cool because it provides um, habitat for uh, a bunch of grazing species, but only those species that are very desert adapted because for months there's essentially no water. There are no water holes, natural or man-made, for miles and miles from here. So only the species that can handle um, long periods without water can actually persist here. So that includes some of the antelope like Gemsbach, which we've seen a lot of and you'll see pictures of. Uh, Springbach, which again we've seen a lot of and you'll see pictures of. Those are probably the two most common antelope uh, in this environment. And there's a few others, Steenbach. But, uh, and then there's a bunch of birds, of course, that uh, like this habitat. The Cory Bustard and the Black Corhand and um, crowned plovers and for the for you birder folks but anyways that's just a little background on this uh, deception valley and deception pan and what this landscape kind of looks like here okay cheers okay I'm in deception pan and just off the side of the road what we see here is a uh, family of four bat-eared foxes. It's a very cool species. Um, they're about a hundred feet away or so. And they're just kind of resting probably after a long night of foraging. And what's really cool about this species, unlike the foxes back in North America that mostly hunt birds, mammals, and other things. These guys are termite specialists. So they'll eat a variety of insects and occasionally a small mammal or bird, but for the most part their diet is almost entirely termites. So one of the several species here in Africa that specializes on termites. Unfortunately it's probably not very clear uh, this uh, video, but uh, hopefully you get a sense of these guys. Very cool. One of my favorites. Bad-eared fox. Okay, cheers. And I guess I should have said that it's probably pretty obvious how they got their name, bat-eared foxes, because their ears 
are big, yeah, like bats, in terms of being out of proportion to the rest of their body. Okay, cheers. I'm out here at Deception Pan in Deception Valley, and it's evening, or getting close to evening, and watching one of the most common antelope species out here in the Kalahari Desert, the Gemsbok, or Oryx, and we'll call this the March of the Gemsbok because there's a string of them and in the foreground you see a springbok the other common desert adapted species both of these species are pretty remarkable for their ability to go for very long periods months even without drinking water they get all the water they need from the plants that they're eating uh, pretty incredible adaptation This is a, another very cool bird of the grassland savanna. It's called a Cory Bustard. And I believe it's the heaviest flighted bird in Africa. So it flies, of course, and I believe its mass is, is greater than any other bird. Of course, the ostrich is much bigger, but it can't fly. And this guy spends almost all of his time basically walking through the grass looking for lizards, snakes, uh, insects, small mammals, birds, you name it. Kind of specialty uh, with reptiles. And they don't fly very often and when they do it's kind of a cumbersome labored flight basically just to evade you know like a predator or something but they don't spend much time up in the air. They get back down to the ground. Very cool bird. Cory Bustard. Okay, bye. Here we are at our Cory campsite in the central Kalahari. And I'm in my lounge chair uh, mid-afternoon waiting for the sun to go down a little bit before I go out on a drive. And this crimson-breasted shrike is sitting above me in the acacia tree. And uh, he was pruning himself, preening, sorry, <laughs> preening himself, cleaning his feathers. It looks like he's stopped right now. Beautiful bird. Okay, guys. I believe you know what I'm looking at. I'm still in Deception Pan and uh, came across this guy. Obviously a male lion. Uh, he doesn't have the black, real black mane that uh, Kalahari is famous for having black maned lions, but maybe he's still a little too young for that. Uh, hopefully he's going to look at us. frozen in his stance. Maybe he hears those black jackals in the back. He's certainly looking towards those jackals. And, yep, he's interested for sure. And not that he's interested in 
hunting them, but possibly if they have some prey, he could steal from them a kill. But he seems very interested. <coughs> doesn't seem to be too concerned with me. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I think I'll pause this video. Because <clears throat> we could be sitting here for quite a while. If he gets up and starts to do something, I'll resume the video. Okay. Still sitting here with this male lion after, I don't know, it's been 20 minutes maybe. And uh, in case you're wondering, I'm about 30 feet away from this lion. Yes, in my vehicle, which he neither sees as a threat or as food. So he's more or less you know, oblivious to me. He doesn't really see me as anything right now. Not bothered by me. Not thinking about eating me. Nothing. Um, but I just wanted to mention that this guy's fairly lean. You can see a little bit of his backbone bird bray. So he's not, you know, real muscular guy. Which means there's a good chance he's just a bachelor. Doesn't have a pride. When males get a couple years of age, they mostly get ousted from the pride. And they go off on their own. And many of them don't make it. Because without the help of the pride to hunt, a lot of times they're just not that successful. So, these guys have a difficult life. Only some of them actually get a pride and do well. Many of these guys just, uh, you know, live out for a couple years struggling. Sometimes they team up with other males um, to kind of eke out their living. Uh, until they either die or they get strong enough that they can get their own pride. But, <clears throat> anyways, uh, that's all for now. I'll resume if something more exciting starts to happen. Bye. Okay. That lion has at least turned around to look this direction for a while. So at least we get a nice look at his face and his mane. He's a beautiful individual. And I guess he does have that dark band of long hair at the bottom there. Living up to the namesake for the Kalari Lions of being dark made. guy is interested in right now. Just kind of relaxing, snoozing, or is he kind of scanning for potential prey? Hard to say. Uh, but he, he's giving me a stare down right now. Uh, it sure is beautiful. King of the jungle. In this case, king of the desert. I sure wouldn't want to get out of the vehicle right now. I'm about 25 feet from him. And it would take him about two seconds to be on top of me. Young 
take a little nap in the road. He seems uh, quite at peace. And he's just going to snooze for a while. Potentially for most of the day, if not all day. I may be here for a very long time. <laughs> I'll check back in later. chapter this uh, line has just been strolling down this road uh, as you can see and about every hundred yards or so he's been scent marking so he's been spraying a little urine he did it on a acacia shrub and then he did it on the ground and used his back paws to scratch a little dirt over it um, at this point, uh, that means it's possible he's got a territory, and maybe he does have a pride somewhere. I'm going to stay with him, because maybe he'll, he'll take me to his pride. Um, either that, or he's trying to establish a territory. In any event, he's heading pretty much straight towards my campsite, which is about, oh, at most a kilometer from here. Maybe not even that far. <laughs> That'll be interesting to see if I... How far he goes towards my campsite and whether I hear him because I have not heard him uh, roaring at night. So, anyways, uh, I'm gonna stay with him and I'll check back in. Bye. Okay, I'm back. Um, been following this guy for, oh, I don't know, about a kilometer or two. He's mostly just been walking down the road every once in a while, scent marking. Uh, but he's peeled off the road at this point, so I probably will not be able to follow him anymore. This might be the end of the story. Uh, good news or bad news, depending on how you look at it, he has turned the opposite direction of my campsite. So he is now steadily heading away from my campsite. Uh... All right, I think that is it for the male lion story. Pretty awesome. And I should point out that, of course, I'm the only one for miles and miles as far as I can tell. So this was a completely private, uh, intimate uh, experience. Uh, hard to beat. All right, take care. Here at Leopard Pan, I'm watching this herd of springbok and we have these two males here that are uh, kind of playing a little bit at uh, who's strongest so they're kind of pushing their heads and their antlers against each other uh, not real serious of course but to watch. Kind of a pushing match. And you hope they don't get their horns locked together and stuck. See who wins this battle. Certainly wouldn't want to get one of those horns in your eye. hear the horns rattling against each other. Okay, I've had enough. How about you? Sure. Let's go back to let's go back to the herd and play. Bye bye. Um Sitting here at 
a water hole, the water hole, in fact the only water for many, many, many miles. Uh, it's actually maintained by the park. There's an actual solar powered uh, groundwater pump that's dumping water out there to keep this as a permanent water hole. And this is in Sunday Pan, which is the site of my uh, current campsite for two nights. And I thought I'd show you this water hole because, well, one, it's a, a cool feature and bound to attract a lot of wildlife. But if you watch these birds coming in, I'll zoom in a little bit. These are flocks of finches, little red-headed finches. <laughs> just coming in in swarms and then they panic and fly away and then come back in. It's kind of fun to watch. They all come in for a very quick drink and then they get scared. And probably rightly so because uh, sitting over in that bush, actually he's left. There was a pale chanting gossock. And goshawks, like other excipiters, specialize in, in predating on birds. Anyways, I'm sure you're going to see this water hole again as I will probably spend a lot of time here in the evening and in the morning. But I thought I'd show you these flocks of red-headed finches which are coming in in the hundreds. Pretty cool. Alright, see you later. I'm here at the water hole at Sunday Pan, which is just a few hundred meters, a couple hundred meters from my campsite. And it's about 3.30 in the afternoon. And look who showed up. This one lioness sort of off to my right. You can see three lying down and one standing in the back. So that makes five lionesses. And I don't know if they, I just got here. I don't know if they've already had their drink. And they're just resting now in the shade because it's still pretty hot before the evening hunt or maybe they've come in and they haven't yet had their drink. Anyways, I will uh, I will continue I will continue this video should they do something. Okay, see you in a bit. Chapter one. Chapter 3 update, <laughs> uh, in case you were wondering, watching a pride of lions when they're at rest is, well, not the most exciting thing in the world. They don't do a whole lot, and in fact they spend most of the day just lounging like this. Um, you know, if they go on a hunt and kill something you know, within an hour or so. They're good for a day or two. Um, so, if this is the entire pride, it looks like there's five of them. This is a, this is a female we're looking at here. And then there's two more females lying down in the back. And these are two males in the front, so it looks like two males and three females, and at least a couple of them still have a little bit of spotting on their belly and legs, which means they're probably, you know, one, two, possibly three years of age. These prides in this kind of desert environment can be pretty small, actually. You can have a pride even of three, but you're probably not going to see a pride of, you know, 15, 20 in the Kalahari Desert because the prey is 
prey abundance is just too low to support a big pride. So this might be the entire pride, and if it is, it could be that these two males here have a coalition and they jointly rule this pride, but to me they look really young. It's either that or they just are lions that just don't have much of a mane and that's possible. The other possibility is the the uh, male that rules this pride, or coalition of males that rule this pride, are out someplace else. And this is the rest of the pride. So that's possible. Hard to say. Um, it's interesting, you know, because there's not a whole lot of prey around here other than Gemsbach. A lot of springbok, but I find it hard to believe these guys could catch a springbok. And it wouldn't feed them very well. A gemsbok would. There's a lot of gemsbok, so my guess is that's their primary pay, prey around here. There's also uh, a small number of giraffe, which they will take, but, you know, not enough giraffe to sustain them over, you know, over the year and over years. There's just not enough of them. And I haven't seen any warthog or any other antelope. You know, there's no, like, buffalo or... There are a few wildebeests out here. Um, and that, of course, would be a primary prey species. But there's not a whole lot of animals here. You know, the densities are very low. Hence, the pride is probably very small. So they probably have a somewhat difficult time of it here. Anyways, that's the end of this chapter. More to come, hopefully. These guys, by the way, are about uh, 25 feet away from me. <laughs> and once again, don't really care about me. I'm no threat to them, and nor do they see me as food, so I'm safe as long as I stay in the car. Okay, more later. Bye. Okay, chapter four, I guess. Uh, if you look at the lions, they're all, they all have their heads up, and so they're all looking behind them back there. They um, either sense or hear or see something, possibly, you know, an antelope like a gemsbok trying to come in for a drink at the end of the day. But they all seem very alert. Uh, in fact, I can hear an antelope snorting out there in the brush to the right. So that's possibly what they're uh, alert to. We'll see if anything comes of this, and if so, I'll be back for chapter five. Bye. decided to get up and walk right past me and as she saw I'm looking at me the whole time she couldn't have been more than 10 feet away uh, okay Ooh. let's see what this guy's gonna do maybe it's his turn to go get a drink we'll see Both of the guys are up now. Let's see what they're up to. A little stretch after that long nap. Gonna be very tentative walking across the mud. It's so funny. I don't like to do that. Here comes our girl back. Let's 
see if our girl joins them. We have four or five of them out there. Nope. She's going the other way. Oh, the boys sat down. So they're in a, they're in a small huddle out there next to the water hole. Oh, here comes our girl. Focus. It's gonna go join them. It just leaves one girl here. Okay, that's chapter five. I'll be back maybe. Okay, next chapter. I kind of lost track. Maybe it's chapter six. Turns out there was another lion, a lioness behind the truck, back there somewhere. And she just started walking in. And so, that ups the number to six. Otherwise, the most excitement we've had in the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, is that uh, the two males who were out on that little island, but the one lioness got up and came back to their original position. Very exciting. Just kidding. But watching lions can be a trial of patience. It's one of those species where um, when they're on the hunt, it's incredibly exciting. Uh, and it lasts, you know, minutes to an hour or so. And then the rest of the time, it's just total boredom. But I'm going to stay with these guys and see what happens as the sun goes down further. Because it's still pretty early. It's still only like a little after 5 p.m. So I've got another hour before dusk. Okay, be back later. Okay, I'm back with chapter... I don't know, I forget. I lost track. And the four lions that left earlier and went out behind me have now circled around and they've spread out. You see two there and the other two have continued around the pond into the the brush over there. Can't see them now. But they've definitely um, they're out on the prowl right now. They've spaced out they're all kind of looking very intently into the bush, um, you know, looking for an opportunity. And if one of them, you know, finds a good opportunity, uh, they'll signal to the others. Uh, but I'm sure right now they're on the prowl looking for an opportunity for a hunt. Okay, I'll be back. Came back with a little bit of an update. So, I'm pretty sure the lead lioness, you know, the, the alpha lioness, who's way out in front, and she is definitely out in the bush looking for something. And these other ones, it's hard to see, but they are all looking towards her kind of in that position, ready, you know, to spring into action if she finds something and they're spread out, which they should be, right? Because if she finds something and kind of chases it back towards them, they want to be kind of spread out so they have an opportunity to intercept. But I'm pretty sure they are definitely in the beginning stages of a hunt, just waiting for that lead lioness to, to find something out there. All right, I'll be back. Okay, quick update. First, a couple corrections. There's at least eight, probably nine in this pride, maybe even more, because there must have been at least a couple lionesses in the bush behind my truck somewhere, because I can see seven lionesses right now. There was two that went way out ahead into the bush. You're seeing one of them coming back right now. 
and then there's four to my left and one to the right plus there's one male on the ground to the right so there's still that other young male so I believe that makes nine and who knows maybe there's some others but clearly what happened is the two most experienced lionesses went way out ahead looking to see if they could find some prey now only one of them has come back so maybe the other one is still out there looking and the others just kind of remain here on the alert ready for the signal uh, for the hunt uh, but I think that's pretty typical the lead lioness or two will go out and you know evaluate the situation find prey whatever and then call the others into action when when she's ready but looks like she didn't find anything out there unless the other one did who hasn't come back yet okay that's it for this chapter okay something's going on They're all off. I'm going to follow, see what happens. And either taking it down herself or the rest of them joined in the hunt, but they have taken down something. And I'm going to have to uh, get my binoculars to see what. But they have made their kill. Um, so they will be feeding tonight. Which is good, because then they won't be hungry lions around my campsite. Very, very exciting. Wow, very cool. Alright, that's the end of this story. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, bye. So, epilogue to this lion kill. Uh, interesting, I haven't seen a single veal go all day. And of course I was sitting at that water hole for, I don't know, well over an hour. Nobody. As soon as these lions went on the hunt, this vehicle showed up. Amazing. I don't know where they came from, um, out of the blue. But, um, it's hard to see. In fact, you can't really see in this video. But they did confirm uh, that it's a Gemsbok that they took down, which is not surprising since that's the most numerous prey out here. It would have either been that or a giraffe. But uh, these guys are just uh, busily eating, taking turns, and two or three of them, four of them at a time. Uh, it's kind of gruesome though. They got blood dripping from their mouths. and So, uh, anyways, that is truly the end of the story. We can sleep well tonight, or I can sleep well tonight. All right, cheers. Postscript on the lion kill the Gemsbach. You, um, the following morning, I'm out here, and you can see there's just the skeleton, basically, with a little bit of meat left on it. Those lions did quite a job. Uh, and then, of course, the scavengers came in, and there's a pack of about seven or eight jackals. Two of them, you see, <laughs> you see on the carcass right now. The other ones are kind of got scared when I came in, and they went into the bush. But uh, between the jackals and I imagine the uh, vultures will all show up later. This thing will be picked clean to white bone by the end of the day. I'm sure. Doesn't take long. Uh, I actually thought the lions might be feeding on this for a couple days, but apparently not. All right. Uh, end of postscript. Bye. Uh, postscript 2. I thought I'd show you what was left of that Gemsbach skeleton after 24 hours. Essentially nothing. Uh, these animals are very efficient. All right. Bye.